This is a CBS News special report. I'm Adriana Diaz in Washington. We are coming on the air with live pictures of the floor of the House of Representatives where members have just voted to expel New York Republican George Santos from Congress. Expulsions from the House are extremely rare. This is just the sixth time in history of the American democracy and the third time since the Civil War that a member has been removed from office by their fellow lawmakers. Santos has survived two prior efforts to drive him from Congress. But two weeks ago, the House, House Ethics Committee, led by a fellow Republican, released a scathing report saying that there is clear evidence that Santos blatantly stole money from his campaign and deceived donors. The committee referred its findings to federal prosecutors, though Santos was already indicted by the Department of Justice earlier this year. He currently faces 23 federal charges, including but not limited to wire fraud, false statements, and aggravated identity identity theft. He has pleaded not guilty. Congressional correspondent Nicole Killian is on Capitol Hill. Nicole, now Santos' tenure from the beginning has been filled with drama down to the very last moment. Tell us about the shifting of the winds this morning and his eventual expulsion. Yes, well, this all started before Santos even came to Capitol Hill. Of course, uh, there were all these accusations that he had embellished his resume, uh, committed a number of falsehoods and uh, stated lies uh, before he even got to Congress. And then once he got here, of course, as you mentioned, he was indicted uh, with 13 counts, followed by 10 counts later this year. All of this sparked an ethics investigation that ultimately found substantial evidence of wrongdoing and and potentially uh, allegations that the congressman may have violated the law, that he used uh, campaign funds for his own personal expenses for things like Botox and designer goods and resort trips. Uh, the congressman multiple times in asking him uh, to defend some of those findings, that he would address it at a later time. He continues to insist that he will have his day in court, uh, but now he is no longer a member of this body as House Republicans overwhelmingly voted to and Democrats voted to overwhelmingly expel him today. This is the third attempt to try to remove him from Congress. There was just an expulsion vote last month, which failed. But today, it is now su successful. And the speaker coming here just now. Speaker. I'm going to make, make, comment, I make one statement. It's been over a month since the House passed our bipartisan support package for Israel. It has been sitting on the Senate desks over there for over a month. It's time for them to take action on that matter. It's critically important to our ally and stop trying to condition it and add it to other things. So we're admonishing the Senate to do their job to get that that uh, very important piece of legislation passed. And that's the only comment I'm going to provide. Mr. Speaker, what does this expulsion mean for your majority, sir? What does it mean for your majority? Okay, so you heard there that the speaker, of course, not really addressing the matter at hand in terms of Congressman Santos's expulsion, but this does uh, reduce Republicans a majority by uh, one vote. They already had a narrow majority, so this makes things even tougher when it comes to passing legislation in this body. Of course, there will likely have to be a special election to fill this seat. It's a swing district, so certainly Democrats are gunning for it as much as Republicans. Adriana. Thank you, Nicole. That's right. That razor thin majority now shaved a little, little thinner. We want to bring in our chief election and campaign correspondent, Robert Costa. Bob, thanks so much for being here. So, a lot of the opposition to expelling Santos revolved around precedent. This morning, House GOP leadership said that they would not vote to expel him. What is the precedent concern, and how did that really come into play here? Sometimes a picture or a hallway interaction says a thousand words. And Nicole's terrific reporting just there with Speaker Mike Johnson really indicates where House Republicans were. They want to move to, on to other issues. They want to stop talking about Congressman George Santos. But you had the House leadership this morning on the Republican side come out and say, we're, got, we're not going to support expelling him. He hasn't been convicted of a crime yet. The Ethics Committee has its investigation and its conclusion. But they believe this is a Democratic propelled initiative initiative and they didn't want to have their fingerprints on it. That said, they didn't lean on members. They didn't whip members to take the same position they were. So ultimately, Santos is expelled. The House leadership doesn't have its fingerprints on that decision. But he, this problem, this headache for them, 
it's now gone. And that's really what Speaker Johnson, based on my conversations with his, his allies, wants. He wants to get Santos off the radar, but he doesn't want to be seen as pushing him out the door. They want to get back to governing. Bob Costa, thank you so much. We also have some breaking news from the Supreme Court, some very sad news. Retired Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, the first woman to serve on the highest court in the land, died this morning in Phoenix. She was 93 years old. O'Connor played a crucial role in the ideological censure of the court during her quarter century as a justice. CBS News Chief Legal Correspondent Jan Crawford joins us on the phone. And beyond being the first woman on the court, she leaves a tremendous legacy, doesn't she, Jan? Well, sure. I mean, you know, trailblazer really is, she's the definition of that word. It's the first female justice. She was a politician before she became a justice. So she was also the first majority leader uh, in any state in the country. But she was an independent, moderate conservative. The principles of self-reliance and pragmatism that she learned growing up on the Lazy Bee cattle ranch in Arizona really shaped her throughout her career. And as that moderate conservative, I don't think you can understate the impact that she had on the law and on the court. I mean, she was the key fifth vote to uphold Roe versus Wade to preserve affirmative action. But also, you know, as a conservative, she provided the fifth vote in Bush versus Gore. And that case really showed her impact on the court because her pragmatic views, her, her approach was very much, that was a decision today, let's move on. And so she was able to kind of bring her justice, her, her fellow justices together. She was very much the glue. I mean, there were so many different opinions and personalities in that court of nine. And O'Connor was such an important role in terms of the relationships that the justices had with one another beyond uh, the impact, the great impact that she had on the law. Now, of course, she was replaced by conservative Justice Amelito, and he has taken the court in a very different direction. In fact, writing the opinion to overturn Roe versus Wade. Jan, that's right. She was the glue, organizing social events to make sure that her colleagues stayed connected. Admitted to Stanford at 16 years old, finished law school in two years, not three. A trailblazer who inspired so many women and men to enter law. Jan Crawford, thank you so much. Our coverage of both of these breaking news stories will continue on CBS News Streaming, your local news, and tonight, of course, on the CBS Evening News. This has been a special report. I'm Adriana Diaz in Washington.